To God be the glory. We're going to be in Psalms chapter 19 today, among other places. Psalms chapter 19. By way of announcements while you're turning, I think due to the sick people today that we have so many of and the fact that it's deer season and we're not going to have much time to hunt, I think we're going to lift services so we can go home and hunt for a while this evening. Next uh, Sunday is the 22nd and that will be our Thanksgiving emphasis. The following Sunday, the 29th, we will be in Michigan. I'll be the outlaw at the in-laws. The Sunday following that, the 6th of December, will be our church, our holiday dinner, a combined dinner for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then the 20th in the evening will be our Christmas program followed by snacks. So those are some announcements. Psalms chapter 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warmed, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, and let them not have dominion over me. Then, excuse me, then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. With the Lord's help, we're going to be discussing verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Are you with me? Or are y'all hung up on the fact that I said we're going to lift services so I could go deer hunting? That proves two points. Number one, church is important. And if I shouldn't skip it, neither should you. Church is important. Two points. One, secondly, our words carry weight. I fed you a slab of bologna. It was about yay big and about that thick. We are having church tonight, prayer at 530 and worship at 6. But the entire time I read scripture, because of one statement I made that was totally false, you were hung up and not listening to me. You couldn't believe that we would cancel church for me to deer hunt. Am I right? Were you all hung up on that? A few misleading words, and look at the damage it was causing. You were bad-mouthing us. You were waiting, couldn't wait till, what is it, June the 30th. And it was all nonsense. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff in the Bible about the words we use. Talking, our mouth our speech, our speaking, our tongue. The Bible is chock full of what we say. You know, there's only one or two verses in the whole Bible that talk about the standards that we hold dear. And yet lots of conservative churches 
hang up on those one or two and totally eliminate all these verses on our mouth and our tongue. Is that the reason our churches are so slim and trim with no vigor or vim? I'll leave it for your consideration. And realistically, truthfully, this message I should be listening to and not giving it. Most of my problems in life are above my neck and below my nose. Most of my problems deal with my mouth. But the Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Words that are acceptable in God's sight. Now that's a tall order. How many random nonsensical things do we say in a day? We use puns and we use jokes and slang words and bywords and catchphrases and fillers. Our words have to be pleasing to God. The Bible says, let them be acceptable. And by default, if some are acceptable, that would mean some are not. There are some things we say that would displease God and would make him unhappy and not be acceptable. So how do we know the difference? How do we know the difference in what we say? Furthermore, why did the psalmist throw in the meditations of my heart? Why didn't he say thoughts instead of meditations? You know, I don't believe we're responsible for every thought that crosses our mind. It's when we dwell on it that it becomes a problem. Now, it's a subject for another day, but what we involve ourselves with can cause us to think thoughts that we shouldn't. You know, we, it can be self-fulfilling prophecy to listen to uh, there, let's, go, let's do it this way. There is some music, there are some songs. I used to listen to a lot of old country music while I worked in the cabinet shop. And there are some songs that if you dwell on those songs, Hearing those songs will cause you to think and do, then dwell on things you ought not. Meditations that are not acceptable in God's sight. So that's a topic for another day where thoughts become meditations, where, where a random thing that flies through, you suddenly allow it to take root and dwell on it. But we are responsible not only for what we say, but for what we dwell on. Because soon enough, under pressure, what we've thought about or meditated on or dwelt on is going to become words. Sean, do you work cattle with Lori? Do you two work together when you're doing cattle? I'm going to give you some words of advice. You may think she has the intelligence and agility of a three-legged goat on ice. You may think that she doesn't know the difference between a calf and a giraffe and she couldn't beat a salted slug to the gate. But don't think about it, because pretty soon you'll say it. I know from experience, the things I think about while Heidi and I are working cattle, you better not dwell on, because under pressure you'll spit those words out. And buddy, then, the trouble's on. The trouble's on. I think about Buddy Albright was working cattle with Marilyn, and they got into it, and Marilyn said, I'm going to house. And Buddy said, I didn't think she'd go. But he said she did. And he said she was almost back there when I realized I've either got to A, apologize, or B, do this on my own. He apologized. But our words, what we're dwelling on, carry meaning. They do make T-shirts that say, I'm not responsible for what I say while working cattle. So that kind of takes the, the heat off. Under pressure, what we've meditated on will come out as words. That's one of the reasons we've got to not dwell on things and not meditate on things that aren't acceptable in God's sight. This, this is a true story. My brother, I hate to ride with him while he's driving. I cannot stand to ride with him. He, he had an old, he bought a Chevy Corsica or Lumina. It was an old cop car and Kevin had he wouldn't fix the master cylinder in it. 
So if you touch the brakes, the first one, you could slow down a little. The second one, you better have both feet and stomp it. He was living in Cincinnati and then moved around Indianapolis. City driving, that kind of guy. He said when he fixed it, he nearly threw himself through the windshield the first time because he was used to both feet. Let's back up to when we were in high school and I was riding with my brother and in desperation I said to him, you drive like a drunken old man. He said, how's a drunken old man drive? I said, just like you do. Under pressure I was saying things that weren't very nice. Oh doggies, the stories we could tell. Our words, in those cases, may not please God, and our meditations need to please God. But you know what? It's our choice whether what we say or don't say is acceptable. So how can, how can we have acceptable words? How can we be sure our words are acceptable in God's sight? Well, let's look at the five W's and the one H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how of our speech that will help us to talk acceptably in God's sight. The first one, who? Who? You know, that's me, you. The words of my mouth. It is a personal responsibility for what we say. Proverbs 13, 3 says, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 21, 23, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. I cannot keep Heidi from bad-mouthing. I can't do it. And you know, she can't keep me from saying things I shouldn't. Good words are a personal responsibility. A personal responsibility. There's a I Love Lucy episode. It's where they are, tra they are traveling somewhere and they go to Bent Fort, Tennessee. And it's one of the episodes that has Tennessee Ernie Ford in it. And Lucy is speeding through town in that new Buick they bought for that episode. And they get taken to the jail. And so they get locked up in the jail and Tennessee Ernie Ford comes. And so they're, they're playing a song and the, the sheriff comes out and he says, you know, I'm going to let you go. But you get out of here and if you so much as say boo, I'm going to lock you in the pokey. And they're walking out, and Lucy looks at him and goes, boo. And the next scene you see is they're all in the jail, locked up. It was her mouth that she only she had control over that mouth. Now, that's a show. That was scripted. That was written. Let me tell you about a real-life situation that happened to me. I was at the sale barn at Ava back in the year 2000, election year. On a truck was four bumper stickers. The first one said, Al Gore for president. The second one said, Bob Holden for governor. The third one said, Mel Carnahan for senate. And the fourth one said, what a difference Jesus makes. And it was more than I could take. I have mellowed a lot in the last 20 years. But in those days, it was more than I could handle. You know, it wasn't anybody's mouth but my own that got me in trouble that day. It was my mouth in the sale barn that got me in trouble because I don't even know the guy, but he and I didn't see the world the same way. Who is responsible for the words of my mouth? Me. Who's responsible for the words of Rana's mouth? Rana. Personal responsibility. What kind of words are acceptable. Who, what, what kind of words? How about good words of encouragement? Proverbs 12, 25 says, heaviness in the heart maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. The psalmist said in Psalms 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. God is pleased with good words. He's pleased with good words, compliments, kind words, encouraging words friend of ours always said, if, if he's got a biscuit, you've got half. Or I've got your back. We're glad for encouraging words. 
You look nice today. That's encouraging. Appreciated your special. It's Good words are always acceptable, provided they're honest. And honest words are acceptable to God. Matthew 5, 37 says, But let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than that cometh, than these cometh of evil. Honest words are acceptable. If we tell somebody, I'll be praying for you, or I'm praying, and we don't, is God displeased with what we've just said? Or if we say, I'm so happy for you, and we're kind of jealous, is God pleased with what we've said? You say, no, it's okay, it'll be all right. And there's still a hurt? It's not being honest. You tell somebody, I love you, and the list goes on and on and on and on of things we say if we're not honest. It's not pleasing to God. We've got to be honest and kind. Keep the kind in there. We need to be encouraging and use good words, honest words, kind words. But what about being consistent? Consistent. James 3, 8 through 10 says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly unruly evil full of deadly poison therewith bless we God even the father and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing my brethren these things ought not so to be you know God does not accept hypocrisy in life or talk you know we can't talk rude and mean and hateful on Tuesday and praise God and testify on Wednesday Swear on Saturday and sing on Sunday. It's wrong. God wants words that are consistent. Words should always be acceptable to God. So what words always are acceptable to God? How about praise? Psalms 51, 15. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. You know, we have a lot as Christians to be thankful for and praise God for. Praises are always acceptable. Always acceptable. So when should we talk to have acceptable words? Well, that depends. See, Ecclesiastes 3, 7 says there's a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And unfortunately, without divine intervention, the only way you learn when not to speak or when to speak is through embarrassment or hurts or discouragement Discipline from your parents. Knowing when to speak is far more difficult than knowing what to speak and what to say. You know, sitting around a campfire, I think back, I went to Colorado several years ago on a hunting trip, and there was three of us went, and, and one of the, two of us were Christians, and the third guy was not. But he was, he was hungry for something. He knew he had a lack in his life. And sitting around a campfire at night and the, up late in the evening, the embers are burning low. You know, you can deal with men's hearts in a situation like that. I've often wondered if it was that trip that turned the corner for David Jewsbury. I don't know if he still is Sunday school superintendent at his church, but for a while he was, and he may still be, I haven't asked. From lost as a goose, through a hunting trip in Colorado, saved to Sunday school superintendent. You can deal with the man, a win, a time to speak. If David was fighting a brush fire and he's trying to, he's trying to stomp out the, a grass fire and the wind's blowing, that's not a time to talk to him about his soul. I caught my, we had a D-17 Alice and I caught it on fire. It was a slow burn. It wasn't burning real fast. I think it was just oil around the engine block somewhere, but it was on fire. So I, I raced up to my landlord's place. I said, I need a bucket for some water. I had a creek right there, but didn't have any bucket. Well, Warren went and found himself a bucket, and in that bucket was the broken shaft of an arrow with a bloody broadhead. Well, that reminded him of a story of the bobcat he had shot. So Warren's telling me about his bobcat. And I said, Warren, my tractor's on fire. I got to go. 
He didn't know when to speak and when not to. There is a time to be silent if we want words to be acceptable to God. Sometimes just no words is what's acceptable. It's not just timing issues. There are instances where people are not willing to hear. Matthew 7, 6, Jesus said, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet, and turn again and rend you. It is possible that what we have to say, like it so often is with me, it's wonderful and brilliant. It's perfectly acceptable, but it's totally lost on the hearer. I tell Heidi sometimes things that are just, they ought to be put in book form and saved for posterity. She's not even listening to me. My timing's off. No, it's really not off. It's just I'm blowing smoke here. But the point is there are times that the listener is not willing to hear, and we don't need to be trying to talk then. There is a time to not speak. We'll skip some of these other points. That's the when. What about where? Who, what, when, where? Where do we need to use our words? Where do we need to speak? You know, we've all heard about people that you go to a restaurant and they get called upon to pray and they don't want to pray and they're kind of obstinate. And so they get down on their knees and pray loud, make a scene, really, is what they do. What they say may be right, but it's the wrong place for it. The where is not right. Now, I've never seen anybody do that. I think think my dad tells about a guy he knew that did. It was one of those deals where you you sat down at a table and you, you ever been around people that put their thumb up and the last one with his thumb up has to pray? Well, this guy didn't know about it and it made him mad. And so that's the one, everybody's thumb went up and his didn't. So he just thought, he just slid his chair back and on his knees and the where. Those words weren't acceptable to God. Not only wrong place, but what about tact? In not only what we speak, but where we speak it. There are stories that I have that are not appropriate for children. So to say an appropriate story or scripture, maybe not scripture lesson, it's not appropriate for children. There are some stories and accounts and things that you can tell and ways to help people that are not appropriate for the squeamish. There are stories and things you can say that are perfectly fine, but they're not acceptable for cat lovers and old cat ladies. The where matters. The where matters. You say, does it really? Well, Proverbs 23, 9 says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of sil- silver. Acceptable words are those that are said in the right place, and it just meshes together and goes together and fits. It applies. It's not awkward. It's not uncomfortable. You know, you can say the right thing in the wrong place, and it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's not pleasant. The where is wrong. If we want to have acceptable words unto God, we need to focus or notice at least where we're saying things. Moving on, why? Why should we be Why should we be concerned if our words are acceptable? It may not be in Scripture, but there are times we have to eat our words. I'm not going to call any names, but if you're here this morning and you're getting married on May 15, I would advocate using sweet words to your sweetness, lest you have to eat them. I don't remember if it was my wedding or my brother's, but Dad said, one of the boys is either me or Kevin. Use words that are sweet, because you may have to eat them. I'll never. Bet you will. Not happening, but it does. If you have to eat some words, better make them sweet. Better make them sweet. 
Words can cause lasting harm and hurts is one reason we need to use acceptable words. I was in the first grade, and on Sunday night, we don't do it as much now because we, we drive, except we do have a snack, but on Sunday night at home, when I was a little boy, we always had a good Sunday night snack, and it was the good food, summer sausage and pickles and cheese and crackers and popcorn and strawberries maybe and shortcake, and good, it was the good stuff wasn't the healthy stuff, it was the good stuff. And I went to school first grade, so this would have been the 1986-87 school year, and was telling my teacher, Miss Stewart, what I'd had for Sunday night snack. And she said to me, I thought you looked a little bigger this morning. Now, was she saying that positively, like you're getting to be a big boy, or was she saying it negatively, like you're a little fat kid? Probably. I really don't know. I took it as your little fat kid. Now, nothing's changed, but I still think about it. We need to be careful what we say, lest it causes irreparable damage in the ears of the listener. We're talking 30 three or four years ago, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Not only might we have to eat them, not only can they cause lasting harm, but we are going to be judged by our words. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words Thou shalt be condemned. I'm not just talking about sermons and lessons and speeches and orations. Every idle word. That's pretty serious business, according to what Scripture says. Because how often has your preacher had somebody pull in front of him and he'll mutter root head under his breath at him? More often than I'd like to admit not always root head, sometimes I call them a knucklehead. God help us. We're going to give an account for the words we've used. I'm going to give an account for the words I've used. Furthermore, I've got to stand in judgment for this message. We're going to be judged by what we've said and say. It's pretty serious business that our words are acceptable in God's sight. We're going to be judged by him. Not only judged eternally, but there are some consequences on earth if we don't choose our words carefully. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Why should our words be acceptable? Good words equals good living. Good manners, good living. And lastly, how can our words be acceptable? One way, keep them not offensive. James 3, 2 says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Gracious words, Ecclesiastes 10, 12, The words of a wise man are gracious. Be kind one to another. Have charity. Charity will go a long way toward keeping our words acceptable. Stay away from places or things or subjects you know are weaknesses for you. You know, there are things that when we get to talking about, we'll say things we are not. We all have hobby horses, soapboxes, things that we just do not like. And if we start down the path of talking and conversing about those, we will ultimately say something we shouldn't. At least I do. And I'm almost perfect and y'all aren't, so I know you do. You know, I've got family that homeschool. We don't. And you know, when you get homeschoolers versus non-homeschoolers in the same crowd, each, each side is well drawn in their battle lines. And the conflict becomes very real very fast. 
So you know what's best to do? Avoid that subject. There's people that see church, how churches should operate differently. Avoid that subject. Focus on what you can focus on. Stay away from subjects we know are weaknesses for us. We don't always have to get people's goat. What's the old saying? If, if they don't know where he's tied, they get the goat. You know, we don't. I know buttons to push on people that I'll push them just to watch them react. And I, I, that may not be right according to Scripture. Am I off base here, some of you older ones that are wiser than I? If we're pushing people's buttons, are we pleasing God? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strifes. There are things we just don't need to talk about if we want our words to stay acceptable. You know, in about three sentences, I can have my sister fighting mad. Heidi says, why do you do it? Well, the truth of the matter is I shouldn't. God help me. Keep my words acceptable. And the last way to keep your words acceptable for the how part is don't use very many of them. 1 Thessalonians 4.11, and that you study to be quiet. You know, I, there are times I regret what I didn't say. There are times I regret not saying something. I had a zinger that would have nailed a hide to the wall, and I didn't say it, and I regret that. But far more often, I regret having said something. Silence can be misunderstood, but never misquoted. And we, know all, we all know it's true that it's better to be thought a fool than open our mouth and remove all doubt. And silence is golden, unless you have to toddlers, and then it's, it's cause for alarm. But study to be quiet. This evening, I think we'll play this back on video and let me listen to the message. A lot of it fits, fits right here. Words that are acceptable to God. And all of this, we haven't even dealt with the tone of our voice or the demeanor of how we say things. Heidi gets on to me, she'll ask a question and I'll say, well, no. She says, what you're saying is true, no, but it makes, it sounds like you're telling me that I'm a, a blithering idiot, that I should know the answer to that. You know, we could say the shirt is, that shirt is black. That's a simple statement. That shirt is black. That's incredulism. That shirt is black. That's, yeah, that can be arrogance. And so the tone of our voice, and we're not even going to go down this path, words acceptable to God. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Is that our goal, to please God and our words and thoughts? I believe it is. May he help us. Let's stand.